Hey, my name is Jesus, and I am the youth pastor here at Charlotte Assembly of God. We are so glad you are jumping on to watch the service from Sunday morning. If this is the first time you've ever tuned into our content, welcome. It is so great to have you with us. For more information about the church, our pastor, and what we believe, go to charlotteag.org or download the CAG app. Each week we gather in person and online to align our hearts in our mission to love God, love people, and live to serve. I hope as you watch this video, you grow closer to Christ and live to love others better. So grab a cup of coffee and your Bible as we dive deep into this week's message. Good morning, Charlotte Assembly God. How are you doing? You excited to be in the house of the Lord? Best place to be. I want to welcome all our, our students from Quorum Dale. You guys have a good time? God work in your life, yeah? We lost your youth pastor. He's probably taking a nap somewhere. That's all right. I remember those days. Maybe we'll find him later. Uh, I'm going to talk fast today just because they're going to fall asleep on me, and that's okay. I, I was a youth pastor for a very, very long time, and I would always call the, I would let the parents know ahead of time. I'm like, hey, your kids are going to have their life radically transformed, but they're going to come home on Sunday afternoon and they're going to be so cranky you wonder what happened to your kid. So I would say let them sleep, let them sleep it off, and maybe the next day ask them all the questions like what it got. Am I right? Yeah. So go home, take a nap. God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Take the nap. And then Colin Garn, please don't leave without seeing me. Does that sound good? That's the way I can get you. I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles this morning to a familiar passage. However, I'm going to break the passage up in a way that doesn't move in the sequence of your Bible. Do, do you know what that means? I'm not. Okay. I don't want to embarrass. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about something that we all can appreciate. But as I open up the passage and speak to it, it's not going to be in the order that you would find in your Bible. But that's okay. It's all there. So I'm going to have you turn to Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. And when you get there, say yes, amen, hallelujah, and just stand up all across the room. Can you do that? But don't stand up until you have it, all right? So when you find it, stand up. When you find it, stand up. I see you back there. You're like, you feel like you won every sword. Some of you guys won every sword drill. That's what I know. I never did a sword drill. Actually, that's not true. I went to a Christian school one time, and they would say, like, Psalm 23, 2, and you'd have to find it. If you don't have a Bible in your hand, that's all right. Maybe you can just stand. That would be great. If you have your phone, that'll work. Doesn't matter. It's the Word of God. I'm going to have you flip over to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 24. I want to communicate this. Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. This is the longest discourse we have of Jesus' words other than the prayer he prayed in John 17. When it comes to strictly teaching, preaching, conveying what the kingdom looks like, this is the longest discourse, the most of Jesus' words in one place. So it's very, very important. What I like about this Sermon on the Mount is it is a counter-cultural understanding of the way the kingdom works. Jesus throughout that is, is blowing everybody's mind because he's saying, look, this is the way the world works and this is the way the kingdom works. And the kingdom really is an upside down world because the kingdom is so different than the world's ways. And what Jesus does is he begins to talk about something that we all care a very lot about. That's money, stuff, possessions. Matthew 6, are you there? Yes. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eats them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal them. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Lean into this. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. And then when you skip down to 24, this is the part that's going to punch you in the gut. No one at Charlotte is going God. Regardless if you live in Eaton Rapids or Diamond Dale, can serve, oh, you came back in the room, I heard that. Can serve, you're tired, aren't you? Can serve, we gotta start over. No one, none of us are exempt. Every single one of us, under the sound of my voice across the whole world, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other, 
and you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot, absolutely cannot, serve God and be enslaved to money. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that it would pierce our hearts and encourage us. And Lord, I pray that you would help me this morning say these very hard things that first service didn't like so much. But they were tired because they lost an hour of sleep. So Father, I just confess once again that I'm 100% dependent upon you. There's nothing I can do on my own accord, but I'm leaning into you and I'm trusting you. God, give me your courage, your words, and your anointing. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that would perceive all that you have for us. And all God's people said. Amen. All God's people said. Amen. Come on, one more time. Give God praise all across the room. All right, I'm going to try to keep you awake, but if you fall asleep, my feelings will not be hurt. I completely understand it. We all have a fascination with stuff. We like stuff. We like buying stuff. We like thinking about buying stuff. We like shopping to buy stuff. I know we don't go to the mall anymore, whatever that is, but you know, we can scroll online and, and see all kinds of stuff. Stuff. Stuff is kind of what makes the world go round. The reason we go to work every day is because we want to have money so that we can buy stuff. And you would agree, and I would agree with you, that there's stuff that we need to buy. Food is very important. Uh, shelter is, I like that idea. Uh, certainly things that we need. You would agree, dads, you need to go to work because you need to feed your kids, right? You need to feed your kids. We need gas, we need cars to get there. Money is not inherently bad. In fact, I would almost say there's nothing wrong with money. The problem is the love of money and this over-consuming desire to have more of it than we actually need. You, whoa, now I feel like a real preacher. Did you hear all those things I said or we got to start over? You know, wait, this is really cool. I confessed a lot of sin and I don't think you heard it. That's amazing. That's how God works. You're just obedient and it like just, it just went over your head. Some of you are like, I don't know about this guy. Come back next week. Three Jordans is, is enough. That's, that's not greedy, right? That's, that's just enough because you have to have a color for I've just always had this issue, and, and it really started when I was, uh, let's say, I think it was sixth grade, what you might call middle school. All my 80s friends in here would recognize that there was a season where Ralph Lauren, those polos were really a big deal, right? So Ralph Lauren was the designer, and then he made polos, and he, th there was a little, uh, a little polo guy here. Right, And so everybody knew if it was Ralph Lauren because there was a little polo guy. And, and somehow every shirt that looks like that has been called a polo, but they're not polos. There's only one polo, and that is made by Ralph Lauren. And you know it's a polo by Ralph Lauren because you can look in the back and see if it's Ralph Lauren, and the logo gives it away. So when I was in sixth grade, everybody's wearing polo by Ralph Lauren, and I didn't have any of it. I didn't have any Ralph Lauren at all. And so my mom is so excited. She comes home and she has two, not one, but two polos. And she lays them out. She says, look what I got. And she's so excited and my heart's pounding. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm going to have polos. And I looked at it and I was in utter shock because I recognized right away that was not polo. That was U.S. Polo Association. And I'm like... No, no, 
my dreams just crashed before. I'm like, no, I was already imagining myself wearing it, the pants and tight roll. I, I had it all in my head. And I get to, I'm already happy with this. Thank you. I, what, what happens is, 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 I'm like, mom, I can't be caught wearing that. They're all going to make fun of me. And she's like, oh, oh, honey, nobody's going to know the difference. Can I tell you, Andy Turner knew the difference right away. Absolutely. You know, I so finally got to a place where um, I just didn't even ask for the polo by Ralph Lauren. I ended up getting the JCPenney brand. It was called Duckhead, right? And it's just like that. That's, that's like, that was like my life, right? And so what happened is, is, is I got a little older, and you guys may be judging me, but I have kids that watch YouTube, and I know what a haul is, all right? I, I know these kids that are opening these these presents that are thousands and thousands of dollars and they spend like three thousand dollars and so forth I got girls I know how this works it so you guys know exactly what I'm talking about you know exactly what I'm talking about there's these YouTube things and these kids open up all these presents and they call it a haul and they bring it down and when you're doing when, like we're talking like makeup that costs like eighty dollars a piece and they're open tons of it and it's just talk about greedy anyway so when I when I got to I guess when I got to the place where I could buy my own stuff and I could buy my own Polo Ralph Lauren. It actually changed the Abercrombie. But I, I got to this place where I just wanted to have that stuff and I, I began to buy a lot of it. I had a job, I worked at Taco Bell making tacos. Uh, I could make like 10 on my arm. And so I, I would make those tacos and they would give me money and then I would go to the mall. You like that? I make tacos, they give me money, I go to the mall. My first job was $4.25 an hour, all right? That's, that, that's how that works, you know? Four dollars to make tacos, and I, I just began to. Can I just use a real um, classy word? I began to curate a wardrobe that I was really proud of, and then I went to Bible college and just going after Jesus. And I was looking at those curated clothes in in my closet, and I thought, "Wow, that's awesome! I have arrived in life." The next day I went to church and we're taking communion much like we did today. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart so clear. I've only had God speak to me this clear a few times. Most of the time it's an inner witness. He might as well been sitting next to me. And he just said, I want you to give all that away. You want me to be naked? How do you give all your clothes away? How does that work? Well, I wrestled. I really wrestled. And, and I knew in my heart what that meant. All the, all the stuff other than essentials. I need, to, I need to give away. And I'm like, all right, Lord. Because my heart was so, like you guys right now, your heart is so tender. Whatever he asks you to do, you're going to jump. But watch out, because as weeks go by, it gets back to a numb place. So just, that's, that's your advice for me. So I got my little Mitsubishi Eclipse, blue with a stick shift. I drove home, and then I went into that room, and I began to pack all this stuff. I'm just folding it so nice, you know, like, you know, like, you know those folding boards that they had, you know, folding it so nice. And, and I'm thinking, all right, God, anytime you can tell me, you know, there's a ram in the thicket, you know. I'm like putting out this, you know, I'm like taking these pants around. All right, God, at any time, take the knife out of my hands. I, I get it. I'm being obedient. Nothing. So I, I load them in the back of my car and I drive. Uh, it's called Highway 10. And I drive all the way back to Pensacola. And I'm, I'm going to give these to a teen challenge. And the whole way there, I'm like, all right, God, any, any time, any time, just, just tell me. I won't. I'll turn around. Crickets. I took those in. I dropped them off. And you got to understand, I'm a little guy. Not a whole lot of guys could have. That was the day when I was like a 28-inch waist. You know, just not a lot of guys. But Baggy was in back then. You guys think it's new? It's not. It's, it's not new. Baggy, we already did that. But I'm glad it's back. Skinny jeans were awful, awful, awful. Just a bad idea. So I, I took them to that teen challenge, and I remember that teen challenge attended our church. And I gave those clothes away. And I remember at our revival service, I would see those guys come in. I'm like, that's my shirt. <laughs> Can I tell you that that one moment of obedience to say, I'm going to not be controlled by these things set me free in a really powerful way. I still like that stuff, but it just doesn't have the same hold. It doesn't have the same hold. And what we have to understand is we live in a world 
that works by buying stuff. All those ads that pop in on YouTube, YouTube Premium, it'll change your life. Best $12 you ever spend a month. I'm just telling you right now, where have you been? But all those ads that pop up on social media and all those ads that, that come through to distract you, what they're wanting to do is to lure you into buying something that you actually don't need. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what we want to buy, thinking what we want to have, and we are pulled in to this economy of goods and services where we are controlled by stuff, the need to have stuff, to have more stuff. And there's a story in scripture, you guys will like this because it's about a young person. And he would have had a YouTube channel, trust me, with all kinds of hauls. Let me, let me read a little bit to you. It's in Mark 10, 17, 21 through 22. It says, as Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. That's a very good question. And looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done. Go. Everybody say go. And sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. It's a wild story because this, this young man, it, it's called the rich young ruler maybe in your Bible. He was affluent, successful. He, had, he was handsome. He had everything that you would want in life, status. He was successful and stuff. That's kind of the three, right? Status, successful, stuff. The three S's of destruction. And he comes to Jesus and he says, hey, of, of all the things that I've got to do, what do I got to do? Like, what do I really got to do? And Jesus goes through the Ten Commandments. You know, thou shalt not kill. That's an easy one. He hadn't killed anybody yet. Uh, thou shalt not, uh, you know, all those thou shalt nots. What happens is he, he, you would almost have the impression, if you're not paying attention, that Jesus went through all the Ten Commandments because the guy's like, I've done all of these since I was young. But what Jesus left out was the, la the first five because those first five commandments deal with man's relationship with God. Meaning, he, he got it right with man's relationship with man, but his heart was far from God because he had so much stuff, the stuff owned him. So much stuff that stuff owned him. God's not against possessions. He's not against Jordans and, and Psalm. He's not against these things. He's just not against possessions. And in fact, you can be the richest person and those possessions have no hold on you. And you can struggle and struggle and have nothing and yet you can have such a desire for stuff, it crosses into a place of greed. It's not the possessions. It's that possessions possess us. It's that the stuff has us. And what God is communicating is I, I'm not going to share the throne of your heart with stuff. I, I'm not going to share the throne of your heart with things that you can buy. I alone am king. I'm the one that sits on the throne of your heart. And what happens for many of us is we get so caught up in what we want and what we want to have and what we want to be seen with that we allow our heart to be divided. This is what's really sad. Of all this, there's two, the two saddest stories in scripture to me. The most sad, which is that a word? Is that okay? The most sad would be when, when Samuel, not Samuel, Solomon, uh, didn't even realize the presence of the Lord had left them. That's super sad. That makes me sad. I don't ever want that to be me. The second most sad is this guy right here. Because Jesus says, hey, um, okay, you got all those boxes checked. And you want to inherit eternal life. But you're missing one thing. Go sell all of your possessions. Give them to the poor. And then you'll put treasure in heaven and inherit eternal life. You know what you're thinking all across the room? I'm so glad. 
I was not there that day. And I was the rich young ruler because we imagine, let's be Noah, let's be Moses, let's be Gideon, but let's not be the rich young ruler. Scripture says he, he left sad because he had many possessions. This guy wanted eternal life, but he cared more about the stuff of this life that he couldn't give it up. Jesus says throughout his word, in essence, this, that life is not measured in how much you own. It's not about what you collect and it's not about stuff. My question for me, for you, for you, yep, you, you. Are we more like the rich young ruler than we want to admit? Th think about this. For, I hate to say it this way, but I will. Think about those of you that are near retirement. That 401k is looking really nice. You don't even know what that is. Why are you laughing? <laughs> you don't talk about that till you're in your 40s. And if you're smart, you'll start them in your 20s. And if you don't touch it when you start, anyway, we'll go on. Don't touch that retirement account. And some of you aren't putting money in retirement account because you think the rapture is coming. Knock it off. You're keeping Jesus from coming. Will you not do that? Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. But think about all that you've worked for, all that you've accomplished. The house with the white picket fence and leave it to beavers coming in. And Wally's like, hey, beef. You know, that, that quintessential life that we want. God's not against security. He's not against comfort. He's not against white houses with picket fences. But what would you do, what would I do, my heart pounds, if God said at that stage of your life, you know, you're not buying diapers anymore. You're, you're not buying, you know, all that. You're, it's a different season. You have more than you've ever had. More than you've ever had. You actually have money in the bank. You know what that looks like. What if God said, hey, it owns you. I want to own you. I want you to give that all away. Yeah, I see your eyes. My eyes are the same. Big eyes, big eyes. This rich young ruler couldn't do it. And he walked away from all of heaven because of stuff. What Jesus essentially quotes to this young man is this in Matthew 6. I'll say it again. Don't store up treasure here on earth. Store your treasures in heaven. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Do you know where your heart is? Log online to your bank account and actually look at those purchases. I know you don't do it. You don't even reconcile it, but that's okay. Go on there. You wouldn't even know if you had fraud on your credit card because you don't look. But I would encourage you to go online and look through at all those purchases because what you will see there is where your heart really is. We can open our closets and we can see where our heart is. We can open our garages and see where our heart is. Some of you, you have so many things in your garage, your car has never been in there. That car don't even know there's a garage. You have everything in the world in that garage, but you're tromping out in the snow, brushing it all off. But you got a nice power washer. Nice zero turn. He says, Matthew 6 to him, he says, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. This guy really thought, and, and, and I don't think it's so much his thinking as much as it is our thinking. We actually believe 
that our life is found in abundance of stuff. Because what he owned defined him. What we own often defines us. It's the comforts of this life that we think are are so valuable. We need them. And it's those things of this life that are temporary, not eternal, that cause this young man to pass up Jesus' offer for eternal life. What about us? Do we actually believe that we can serve both God and money? I'll take a sip of water while you think about that. Jesus communicates at the end of the story that it is hard for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. Do you know who the rich man is? You. If you were to look across the world and what the uh, average income is and quality of life, we're at the top. The question is, I really wonder, do we have everything we want? I don't know. But do we have everything we need? Probably. And it's easy in this society to overextend ourselves, and that's really where our problem is. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be. 1 John 2.15 gives us a real stark warning. It says, do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Pause on that. Do not love the things of this world. Because if you do, you don't have the love of the Father in you. Now, this, this is challenging because it's not about the things. It's about loving the things so much it, it occupies our mind and our desires. What, what is being said there is we cannot love God and love. Okay, and thank you. Jesus says this in Matthew 26, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world? Do you know they have these, I was watching this YouTube thing. They have Jordans that sell for like $15,000. Like why would anybody do that? I don't even understand it. Anyway, but if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you, like $20,000 too. Like I, this crazy, like this one guy buys the whole table of Jordan. It's like $100,000. Bad, bad idea. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? This ruler had the whole world. Some of us may have the whole world. We have the corner office. We have the title. We have the credentials. We walk in and everybody's intimidated. But what is worth losing all of eternity for. See, he he had the whole world, but what he lost was actually the most valuable. In the end, it is what we let go of that adds the most value to our life. See, they're awake. They didn't fall asleep. They're like, we don't got credit cards yet, so they feel okay. You know what I'm saying? But you guys over here, you're like, you've been swiping, scanning. When we stop seeking after the world's possessions and we start seeking after the kingdom, God adds to our life everything that we need. And some, and some. Look, I didn't need a Ralph Lauren polo. I mean, that, you know. Let's say it. I didn't. I needed a shirt, right? When we seek after the world's possessions, it's empty. But when we seek after the things of God, it adds to our life. Matthew 6, 33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. An abundant life comes from God, not the things of this world. 
Luke 12, 15, gives me pause. It says, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. It doesn't matter if you have a garage full of stuff. Some of us, we have a garage full of stuff, and then we have pole barns full of stuff. And we don't even know what's in there. It's just stuff. And we have extra things in case that stuff breaks. You have stuff. You may have a storage shed, and you don't even know what's in that storage shed. That's, that's bad. Just, that's not a good thing. When we let go of the world's stuff, like Jesus was asking this ruler, it adds the things of the kingdom. So hold on to that. When we let go of the stuff, we add the things of the kingdom. When we add the world's stuff, we lose the things of the kingdom. You don't believe that over, over here? Okay. That's because they have credit cards and debit cards, and they have a mortgage. That's, that's why. That's why. And then they bought this furniture, you know what I'm saying? Oh, sometimes they buy big TVs just for the Super Bowl. And it's like, why, why do we do that? They still watch TV. That's what's wild to me. Like on a TV. Some of them have cable. Satellite. The abundant life Jesus promises us when we let go of the world's things is a life of provision. And it's truly a life where he becomes our source. This is how the kingdom works. We add to our life by subtraction. In other words, it's addition by subtraction. What adds the most to our life is what we actually subtract from our life. So when God says to this young man, let go of all these possessions. The reason he is saying that is not because he's a cosmic killjoy. The reason he's saying that is because he wants to add all the benefits of the kingdom to his life. Let me read these and then I'm going to wrap up because I got four minutes and 11 seconds. And I'm going to do it this time because they'll fall asleep. Did you make Pastor Jesus preach that fast, or are you just making me preach that fast? All right. In fact, we'll even have somebody come out if they're still here. I have no idea. Matthew 6, 25 to 27. Let me read a couple scriptures to you. Uh, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? We spend a lot of time worrying about what we have. We spend a lot of time worrying about what they have. And they have it, so now we want it. Yes? We, we spend a lot of time worrying. Worrying. I can't afford that, but I'm going to do it. And now we're worried we can't afford it, even though we have it. I got two bags of golf clubs. I just need to get that out, put that out there. I've got a cart bag, and I've got a stand bag. I just need you to know that. Three is where it gets greedy. And just so you know, every time I replace a golf club, I give them away, all right? I never sell them. Worry doesn't add anything to our life. And it's easy when it comes to finances and money. So here, here's how this kind of works, right? Is somebody here? I don't know. I don't know either. I did everything today. I welcomed. I did announcements. I, I did the whole thing. I... I need a vacation. I only work one day a week, so we're good. It's a 60-hour day, though, just so you know. There, there is worry. We do worry about having what we need. That, that, I understand that. You know, we worry about is there enough. I mean, look, a bag of salt costs $12 now, right? A year ago, it was like $7. There is a part of our heart that can be consumed by worry just to have the things that we need groceries and if you have kids you're paying for this concert and you're paying for this trip and you're paying for, sorry too soon but Jesus says you can worry about that but it doesn't add anything to your life 
So you can worry about things you want. It doesn't add to your life. You can worry about things you need. It doesn't add anything to your life. Worry never adds anything. Actually, worry subtracts from our peace and our comfort. Yeah? And that, that's why Jesus, why it says in Scripture, like, it's better to be poor and no worries than it is to be rich and have all kinds of worries. When we subtract this desire for the possessions of the world, when we subtract this desire for stuff, hey, you can come out, that's all right. When we subtract that longing to have more than we need, we're adding the peace of the kingdom, we're adding the provision of God, we're adding the peace of mind that we need to have, that we are always gonna have enough. Look, there's times, and, I could t- and I'm gonna talk more about this next week, but there's times where God provided I, I just, I'm blown away because when we were younger, uh, more flexible, but when we were younger in our 20s, I remember thinking I'll never be able to afford, di- it was like $80 a month for diapers. I don't know how much they are now, I don't even care. But I, I remember when we got out of, di- I don't care, I've already been there, do not care. We got out of those diapers and I remember thinking, wow, we have an extra $80 a month for something, right? And, and you guys dropped that at a restaurant, you and your wife, more than that. But back then, that was, that was big money. And so the truth of the matter is, we never went without. I don't know how it worked. Mathematically, it should have never added up. That was algebra, because you know how algebra doesn't make sense? That's how our finances were. It made zero sense. But God always provided. God always provided. I remember when I went into ministry, my dad's like, you know they don't make any money, right? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't think about it. So I got, I got to land this because I messed. Watch this. Mark 6, 3, 1 through 3. Don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? What will we wear? These things dominate, consume, fill the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. God is the one that provides everything we need. And many times we worry and we worry because we think it's our hustle and it's what we produce when we go to work that makes the way. And the truth of the matter is this, you may hustle and you may work third shift, but it's God that gives you that healthy body. You don't know because you're so young, but there's a point where you're like, everything hurts. The truth is this. God is our provision. He is our source. And we don't have to worry because he can make manna fall from heaven and he can make manna cup up from the ground or wherever it came from and quell fall from heaven, right? Forget it. Manna and quell. He can make manna and quell happen. He He can give you money by going fishing and pulling out that fish and there's some coins in there. When we do not become consumed with the world's things, that it possesses us, it owns us, we're adding the kingdom, which is provision, peace, comfort, assurance that we are going to be okay and we will have what we need. And many times God gives us more than what we need because God desires to be a blessing to us. God desires to be a blessing to us. What owns your heart? By not giving up the world's possessions, this this young, rich, successful man was actually adding all the worries of his life. What can I produce to have more? How can I have more? Because I need to have more. I'll close with this. When we attach our hearts to the world's riches, we will add anxiety and worry. When we attach our heart to the kingdom riches, we add abundance and peace. By not giving up the worldly possessions, this rich young ruler gave up all of heaven. I think we all 
can connect to this moment because it's a challenge for all of us. Regardless of where you fit socioeconomically, the world's things have a pull on our heart. Just tugs, tugs. And what Jesus says is you cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. You'll love the one and despise the other. Or you'll hate the one and love the other. Would you stand all across the room? Thanks, Tim. I want to pray for you this morning. And I want to, I'm going to close with this. I'm not going to say all that, guys. I'm not good at all. I'm going to say all this, not that. There's nothing wrong with us examining our hearts today and asking the question, do I possess things or do things possess me? Because I don't want to miss heaven for the things of this life. Watch this. The rich young ruler gave up that which does not last for that which lasts forever. I'm, I'm not middle-aged. I'm close to middle-aged. I can see it. I, I, can, I can almost touch it. Like I'm, I might be middle. I'm in the middle. Let's say I'm not. We're, I'm not quite in the middle, but I'm close to the middle. Very close, unfortunately. Let's say I live another 50 years. I might be out of retirement money by then. Let's say I live another 49 years. That's but a breath. That's but a breath compared to all of eternity. It's but a breath. We can't serve both God and money. He will not share our heart and our affections. And so this morning, as you close your eyes all across the room, I want you to ask yourself, do I have stuff or does stuff have me? Do I have stuff? Do I have that stuff with an open hand? Or does stuff have me? Does stuff have me? Let me pray this prayer for you. Jesus, I ask today that, that we would be aware, honest with ourselves and with you. That God, we would not have a divided heart between the between the things of this world and, and the things of heaven. May we have the ability given to us by the grace of God to lay up treasures in heaven that last forever and not lay up treasures on earth that are here today and gone tomorrow. Help us to be aware of what tugs at our heart and may we recognize the best things of life the most valuable things in life are those things that are kingdom because they last forever. Lift your hands to heaven one more time. God bless your people this morning. Be their strength and be their source. Lord, continue to lead and guide their steps. May there be healing in their body. May there be wholeness in their mind. Lord, we thank you for everyone, these young people. God, the work that you began in this weekend, God, may it continue and may it continue and may it continue and may it continue. And God, may they never go back. May they never go back. May they never go back. The things that they lay down at the altar, the things that they lay down to the altar, God, and the decisions that they made and the choices that they're gonna make this week. God, I pray that they would never go back. They would never go back. They would live separate all the days of their life for the purposes of God. Bless your people this morning. Be the lifter of their head. Strengthen them. Help them to forgive me for what I just preached to them. But they did much better than first service, so we love them. God bless you. God keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Have an amazing day. Thanks for watching. If you have a prayer request or more questions about God or the church, go to charlotteag.org. 
and hit the connect tab so we can be in contact with you. We hope you have experienced the life-changing love of Jesus Christ through this message. If you are looking to get connected, one easy way is to join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights as we pray. And don't worry, because there is a place for your child or student as well. Have a blessed day, and may Christ's love shine upon you.